Look at Leviticus chapter 19, the first two verses. This is the word of the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Let's pray. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the gathering of your people. We thank you for the person in the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we are asking that you would send him now to take control of this time, to send your word forth with great power and authority, with clarity, with truth, with conviction. Pray that this word would encourage those who are down, discouraged, that it would convict those who are rebelling against you. Uh, defiantly. We pray that it would build up your church uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ, not for our name, but for his name. We pray these things, and amen. So, the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, you shall be holy. Tell, tell all the people, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, it's true that if you quote from Leviticus these days, people tend to look at you like you just pulled something out of the weird closet. Uh, and, and we, right, we, we, Leviticus is the, Leviticus has been the butt end of endless Bible jokes, has it not? You've made them, I've made them. Uh, we know the book of Leviticus to be the great destroyer of Bible reading plans everywhere. <laughs> You start off in Genesis, and you get a lot of stories. You're like, oh, this is kind of cool, you know, and you, you get Noah and Abraham and lots of exciting things happening, and uh, you get into Exodus, and there's a really amazing story in the book of Exodus, how God delivers his people through Moses, and, and, uh, and then about halfway through Exodus, the laws start to come, and you're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm on this plan, I'm going to plow forward, and then you get to Leviticus, and uh, you, you say, well, you know what? I think I'll just read the Psalms. <laughs> I like those. Um, in fact, when I was growing up, uh, my, my dad and mom did a, an incredible job of, of uh, introducing me and my, my two sisters to the Bible, to the Word of God. And so from the time I was just a little, little kid, from before I can remember, uh, uh, my dad was reading the Bible out loud to our family in times of family worship. And uh, we, we marched through over the course of, I, I probably, it took, I think, 10 or 12 years uh, from the time I was a little kid all the way up till in either middle school or junior high somewhere, or, or a high school, somewhere around there. We read through the entire Bible out loud as a family. My dad just reading one chapter at a time. The entire, the entire Bible. Um, but uh, turns out, Turns out he had skipped Leviticus, and so, and so I remember he closed he closed the Bible last chapter of Revelation, closed it, said, "Wow, we did it, everybody!" And uh, I raised my hand. And I said, "No, we got to go back and do Leviticus." So we literally went back and did Leviticus, and and ended with that. But uh, if if we we here's here's the truth, and and we can have fun with it, and it is it is a hard book. There's no doubt about it. It is a hard book. Uh, but if we, if, we ignore, if we ignore Leviticus, uh, just like if we were to ignore any book uh, of the Bible, we ignore it to our own detriment. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes we treat Leviticus as kind of this punching bag, right? This, this, this sort of pinata that we take swings at. And we, and we do it in order to make the point that we, of course, don't want to take holiness too far. I mean, we don't, want to be, we don't want to be Pharisees or anything. Certainly not. We don't want to be Pharisees. We don't want to start going Leviticus on people. Now, um, aside from the fact that not wanting to take holiness too far is a strange point for Christians to be making, it is indeed true. It is indeed true that we don't want to be like the Pharisees. Certainly not. For the Pharisees, did not take holiness nearly far enough. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds 
that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible never speaks negatively against the Bible. Did you know that? The Bible never speaks negatively against the Bible. Even, even the law, right? Even the Old Testament law, the Bible will never speak ne- negatively against the Bible, including the law. The longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119, is a chapter of the Bible about the Bible. It's about the immeasurable value and worth of the Word of God. And then you also have Psalm 19, and this is kind of just a little, uh, little uh, pro tip for you, just, just great little uh, memorable markers there. You have Psalm 19, and you have Psalm 119, and both of them speak about the uh, immeasurable value of the Word of God. Listen to the words of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. I believe that future generations of the church, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking generally here, uh, capital C church, I believe future generations of the capital C church are likely to critique this current generation of the church for giving lip service to the idea that Scripture is authoritative while functionally turning away from it by not believing that it is practical. In other words, we have a form of sola scriptura, which is a Reformation doctrine, scripture alone, scripture alone. We have a form of sola scriptura, appealing to scripture as the highest authority, but we are tempted, we are tempted in these days to deny its power. The real test for whether or not you believe in the authority of scripture is whether or not you believe that scripture is practical whether or not you believe that it is actually useful for absolutely everything. Scripture is not just breathed out by God. It is profitable to equip us for every conceivable good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable or useful for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for not just some, not just most, every good work. And so, to the, law, to the law we turn, to the law of God we turn in Leviticus. And what do we find? We find, wouldn't you know it, that it is, in fact, immensely practical, even for us in the year 2022. God tells his people through his law in Leviticus, he says, be holy as I am holy. Today, many Christians wonder about how to discover God's will for their lives, but they don't need to wonder because God has already told them His will, be holy as I am holy. Today, many people have a cheap view of the love and grace of God, but if they understood the weight of sin and the immense cost of blood atonement, that blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sins, that this is what makes the grace of God possible in the first place, they would not be so trite in their spiritualizing. And today, many lawmakers scoff at God's law, and they think that they are wiser than the creator of heaven and earth. And so they legislate sin, and they codify foolishness, and over the cliff tumbles the culture that scoffs at God and his word. And so Leviticus is immensely helpful and practical for us. And I want to show you four themes from the book, four big ideas from the book of Leviticus. Number one, God is the standard. God is the standard. Now, if you just look, you can either look in your own, your own Bibles at, at kind of the rest of uh, Leviticus 19, the entire chapter, but I've got this, this uh, in, in the spirit of keeping things simple, I have this graphic. Um, <laughs> and uh, if, you just, if you just look at this, though, uh, what do you think the big idea is of Leviticus? 
uh, of Leviticus chapter 19. Not that hard to, to figure out. And the Lord, the Lord, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. To the Lord, to the Lord, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, to the Lord, before the Lord, to the Lord, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord, I am the Lord your God, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. All right? What do you think the big idea is? Isn't that, a, isn't that amazing to see? God is literally saying, I am, I am who I am. He's saying, I am, I am who I am. The, the personal name for God that he revealed to Moses at the, the story of the burning bush. Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell them I am who I am sent you. And, and that it's, it's the name Yahweh, and it's represented in the Bible every time you see the word Lord with all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that represents that name. And so, so when, uh, when, when over and over again God says, I am the Lord, all capital letters, He's quite literally saying, I am, I am who I am. I am, I am who I am. And the big idea is this, that God's word is directly connected to God. God's commands are not arbitrary. They are not random. They are an absolute necessity of reality because they flow from the very character of God. God is the standard. And you cannot separate his law and you cannot separate his word from him. They they go together. They are inseparable. And 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 his word, the foundation of his word, it comes straight out. It flows right out of his character, flows right out of who he is. So, uh, So God has a standard, yes, but more accurately, God himself is the standard. He is the standard. You think about uh, uh, parents in the room, parents who have children and, um, well, all parents have children. (laughs) Deep thoughts. Um, So uh, for those parents who have children, uh, I'm sure that you are, I'm sure that you have never done this. I know I never do this. Uh, but you give, you give your children a, a standard to follow, right? You give them a rule, a standard t- uh, to follow. Uh, and, and, and then you teach them how to break that standard through your own hypocrisy, right? Uh, it's, it's the dad who says, you must respect, you must respect your mom. You must respect your mom. And then he loses his temper and raises his voice, right? Uh, God... Oftentimes, oftentimes, we have, what's that word? That word is hypocrisy, right? We, all of us, all of us, to varying degrees, varying ways, we all have hypocrisy. God is not like that. There is no hypocrisy in God. What God says, what God gives, God's standards, inseparable to his character, absolute and total and utter integrity. God is the standard. So, a uh, point of application for all of us in the room, point of application would be you need to personalize obedience. Personalize your obedience to, to Jesus. You're not just obeying uh, an arbitrary list of abstract rules and principles that you, that you can print out on a sheet of paper and post somewhere, um, although you, you could write them out, you could post them. That God has written them out. He's spelled them out. But, but these are not abstract ideas or principles removed from uh, having a personal relationship with God himself. It's, it's all connected. And so, so when you think about obeying Christ, when you think about obeying the Bible, uh, know this, that it, is, that it is an immensely personal thing to be doing. It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an issue of relationship. It's an issue of relationship. So that, so that when you... When you disobey God's rules, you're not just sinning against the standard, you're sinning, you are, uh, but, but behind the standard is God himself. So you're, so you're actually sinning against a person, right? The, God himself, 
He's a personal God. And so too, when we obey him, the positive side of this is when we obey him, this is, this is how we love him. This is how we love him. This is, this is all about relationship at the end of the day. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So it's not just, a, it's not just an exercise of checking the box according to some abstract ideas out there. It's a, it's a matter of the heart, connecting with God personally and relationally. That is what obedience is. It is all about relationship with Him. So personalize your obedience. When you think about, back to, back to parents for a second, when you think about your kids, you, you don't want them to ultimately just hate the idea of messing up and looking stupid in front of other people. That's not the primary motivator, right? Uh, uh, you, have the, you have standards, you have rules, uh, you have uh, uh, guidelines for behavior, and you don't want them to be, you don't want them to be, a, to be afraid of, of just sheerly messing up and looking dumb. You want them to, rather, you want them to love, you want them to love being in relationship with you, with their siblings, with everybody. You want them to love that. You want them to love the family. That's what you want them to love. You want them to hate the idea of being separated out of that relationship because of sin. You want them to love the idea of being in relationship and in fellowship. That's the, that's the heart issue. Uh, number two, sin is a judgment in and of itself. Sin is a judgment in and of itself. We see this, you can see this all throughout the book of Leviticus. In fact, <laughs> You think about this, so much of what's going on in Leviticus with uh, the sacrificial system of, of the ceremonial law of how, how the, the, uh, the Israelites would, would atone for their sin ultimately is a foreshadow of Christ, but how they would do this, this tabernacle worship and later the temple, this temple worship where they would bring bulls and goats and lambs and birds and the blood of those animals would be spilled over and over again, over and over again. Okay, why are these sacrifices taking place in the first place? Why are they even happening? Because of sin. You see that? Because of sin. Uh, and so, so much of, so much of the law, uh, so much of the law is given, and Paul even says that, says this, that the law was added because of transgression. The law was given because of sin. Uh, and you see this, that, that sin, sin is, Sin incurs judgment and itself becomes a judgment in and of itself. And so in Leviticus chapter 26, God is laying down blessings for faithfulness, blessings for covenant faithfulness for his people. He says, if you, if you obey me, if you, keep, if you follow my law, if you obey me, you will be blessed. And this is, this is the, the blessing. These are the blessings you can expect. But if you disobey, if you are unfaithful, if you go your own way, if you turn away from me, if you turn away from my decrees, if you turn away from my word, there will be judgment. And here's the principle. As disobedience increases, judgment increases to meet, to meet that increase of disobedience. As disobedience increases, judgment increases to meet it. Sin itself becomes the judgment's or becomes the judgment. One of the examples of this is Leviticus 26, verse 29. It's a hard verse to even look at. It's a hard verse to even look at. Leviticus 26, 29. This is down, this is down the line a little bit, right? The, the people have, right? God is, God is establishing, here's, here's the progression of how things are going to go down. If you rebel and you turn from me and you go your own way, then you can expect these judgments. But if you, if you turn... Right? If, then, if then you turn back and repent, I will hear you and I'll restore you and you get all the blessings again. But if, but if you don't turn and you keep going, then, then judgment is increased. And if you turn back, then I'll, then I'll hear you, I'll forgive you, and you'll, you'll be back into, into the land of blessing. But if you keep going, you keep going, there's different iterations of judgments. And so down the line uh, in that progression, we get to Leviticus 26, 29, and God says, you will eat the flesh of your sons, and you will eat the flesh of your daughters. 
That's a hard verse to look at. And historically, that actually happens in 2 Kings chapter 6. So God, God told them what would happen, and wouldn't you know it, it happened, exactly as God said it would happen. 2 Kings chapter 6, the city of Samaria, which at, at the time is the capital of uh, the kingdom of Israel, because the kingdom was divided, Israel and Judah, and so the capital of Israel is Samaria, and the city of Samaria is under siege. It's being attacked, it's under siege, and there's historical accounts of parents cannibalizing their own children. The sin becomes a judgment in and of itself. This happens again historically in the year 70 AD when Jerusalem is destroyed. And lest we imagine ourselves in our advanced, civilized, modern day, so-called, to be far and away above such grotesque things, let us remember that we are living in a culture that murdered 61 million preborn babies in 50 years, that we're the culture that uses the bodies of those babies in various dark ways, sometimes to develop things that we will then put inside of our bodies, the living trying to steal life and energy from the bodies of the dead, not just the dead, the murdered, not just the murdered, our own children. And so just like the law of God told us, it happens. Sin becomes a judgment in and of itself, even to that point of stuff that is hard to even look at, stuff that is hard, stuff, stuff that you want to turn away from. We're the culture that sexualizes children through Netflix shows and Disney and pornography, and we're the culture that mutilates children in the name of identity and self-expression, in the name of progress, science, and worst of all, in the name of love. And so it's hard to consider these things, but we must consider these things because we need to be honest about where this, our culture our culture is not on the way to, when you read Leviticus 26, our culture is not on the way to that. Our culture is that. We're there. And so here is, here is the application that I want to give you. I, 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 want, I want you to think about this. Let the insanity, let the insanity of sin fortify your courage to walk in the truth. Allow the insanity of sin for, to fortify your courage to walk in the truth. God is not crazy. God is not crazy, and the Bible is not crazy. And so Christians who are on the side of God and on the side of the Bible are not the crazy ones. Right? The, we're not the crazy ones. The, the culture that, that uh, insists on going its own way is on, the, is on the, the road of insanity, on the road of destruction, where, where along that line, on that journey of just outright defiance, sinning with a high hand against God and not turning back and not listening to, not listening to wisdom and not listening to truth, uh, along, along that progression, there are very, very dark, very evil, gut-churning, grotesque things on that road. And so Bible-believing Christians are not the crazies, no matter what the culture says. And so I want to encourage you, let the insanity of sin fortify your courage to walk in the truth. And it's also important to, to see this pattern in your own life, right? Not just, not just to point the finger out there and, yeah, it's all, it's all evil out there, those, those, that evil culture out there but to know from your own life and your own experience that when you turn off of the road, when you turn away from Jesus, when you go your own way, that, you, that, that, is, that is an exercise of craziness. That is an exercise of insanity. And many, many people in this room, you, you can testify through your own story and your own life. Yeah, I want to stick close to Jesus because I know when I go my own way, that's, that's crazy town. That's crazy town, and, there's, and there's, there's terrible things on that road. Uh, when hard-hitting truth from the Bible is preached in this church, as it regularly is, and we should all be thankful for that, know this, that the words, the words hit hard, the words of truth 
the words from God's word, they hit hard, not because they have a deficiency that makes them overly blunt. The reason that the words hit hard is because our culture has a deficiency that has made it overly evil. And so there's just, there's just an inevitable, inescapable, uh, total and complete clash of worldview, of direction, uh, of, of truth versus lie, of righteousness versus evil, of blessing versus absolute judgment and destruction. And so the words, the words of God in our day and age, if you ever feel like, if you're ever listening, you know, if you're ever listening to, to a sermon and you know it's true, you know it's from the Bible and you know it's true, but it, it, uh, it ruffles your feathers a little bit. That's a good, that's a good check for your spirit, for your heart to examine yourself. Okay, am I allowing my hair to be blown by the cultural winds? Or uh, am I, am I, am I going, am I, have I been influenced? Or uh, am I aligning with, with the grain of God's word? If, you're, if, you're, if your feathers are ruffled and the words are hitting hard, the words don't have the deficiency. The culture has the deficiency. And, and that, that, uh, the violence of that clash is just an inevitable, inevitable thing. So let the insanity of sin fortify your courage to walk in the truth. And then think about, think about Ask yourself this question, is, is sin really worth it? What a, what a great question to ask in a moment of temptation. Is it worth it uh, for, you, for, uh, for you kids in the room, okay? Give me your eyes for a second. Uh, e- even if you're in high school, even if you're a little older, okay, you kids in the room, uh, your mom asks you to do something or your dad asks you to do something, is that eye roll worth it? Come on now. Is it worth it? Um, is, that, is, is participating in or tolerating uh, for everybody that, that moment of, of gossip or slander, is it worth it? Is it really worth it at the end of the day? Is that envy in your heart worth it? That jealousy, that bitterness, is it worth it? Uh, are, those, are those words of, com- of complaining, are they worth it? Right? I won't ask you to raise your hand, but you know, how many people are already complaining about winter? Right? <laughs> you woke up this morning and the first words out of your mouth were complaining. Is it worth it? Is that complaining worth it? Is it getting you what you want? Are you becoming who you really want to be? Is sin worth it. Remember that sin is a judgment in and of itself. Uh, Number three, holiness is about separation. Holiness is about separation. Huge theme in the book of Leviticus. Chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, we read this, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. You see the big idea of that text. God is saying, don't be like, don't be like the nations who do not worship me. Don't, be, don't do what they do in Egypt. Don't do what they do in the land of Canaan. Do what I tell you to do. Be like me, God is saying. And so he's, he's enacting this, the idea of separation, that they must be separate. They must be set apart. They must be different. They must be other. They must be separate altogether from the nations who are around them. And this is really getting at the heart of what holiness really means. God is holy which means that he is separate from everything else that is. He is separate from everything else that is. He alone is creator. And everything else in all of existence, from insects to particles to planets to men and women made in his image, are in the category creature. 
God, God alone is in the creator category. Everything else from this pulpit to this stage to you is in the category creature. There is God and there is not God, and God is the only one in the first category. This separation is at the heart of what the Bible means when it says that God is holy. And so too at the foundation of God's law is God's holiness. And this is why God says, be holy, be holy as I am holy. Well, how do you do that? Right? How do you practically do that? Well, you have to enact the principle of separation in your life. You have to enact the principle of separation in your life. So the Israelites we're told to be separate from the other nations who do, who do not work. Don't, don't be like the Egypt, Egyptians. Don't be like the Canaanites. Be like me, God says. And so, too, we are to engage this principle of separation when it comes to fighting the battle of sin. Uh, enact the principle of separation in your own life when you, when you are fighting and putting to death your sin, when you're facing temptation. Enact the principle of separation. Do whatever you have to do. Be, root, be ruthless about it. Be absolutely ruthless about it to separate yourself from the sin that... Now, check this description of sin that the Bible gives us. Sin that, that does what? Sin that so easily entangles, right? In other words, sin wants, to, sin wants to mix it up with you. Sin wants to stick to you. Sin wants to adhere to you. Sin wants to fuse into you and no, we need to enact the principle of separation. No, no, separate yourself from sin. You know the, uh, the phrase, kind of the cultural truism, the phrase, uh, violence is never the answer? What a stupid saying. Because, because sometimes it is, right? Is it not? Sometimes it is. Uh, uh, when you are facing uh, when you are facing that sin in your life that so easily entangles, I want to give you permission to be, to be violent about it, right? To be ruthless about it, to enact this principle of separation. So, uh, so okay, what, what, what led to what led to what led to that sin? And go back, go back to the very beginning and enact the principle of separation there, right? Well, well if, this, if this leads to that sin, I'm going to separate myself there, uh, and, and for some, right, for some, it might be, it might be people. Now, now we love people, yes. We, uh, we want to make disciples, yes. We are all about people, yes and amen. Uh, but for some of us, this is common with new believers, and I would say also for, for maybe specifically young people in the room, although not only young people, because older people can fall into this too, uh, very easily. But there just might be relationships, friendships in your life that pull, you, right? You think, you're, you think you're being the influencer. You think you're there on mission. But, it, but time and time again, that relationship pulls you down into sin, enact the principle of separation. So for, so for high school students, junior high, high school students, you have friends at school or on the sports team or wherever you have friends, Enact this principle of separation, not to become a, not to become a self-righteous Pharisee, but to say, right, to say to this group of friends, hey guys, this is where I'm going. You're welcome to come with me, but I will no longer be joining you here, right? At, at, in these situations or these environments or in these conversations, uh, I, I'm, I, am, I am separating myself from that because I love Jesus and my allegiance is to him. Now you're welcome to come and learn about him. I'd love, you know, come... Come to Anchor with me. That's where I'm going. Enact that principle of separation. Holiness is about that. Holiness is about the principle of separation. An application, to put this in a point of application, separate yourself from your sin for the sake of what is infinitely better. Separate yourself from your sin for the sake of what is infinitely better Namely, what? And this gets back to the primary heart of motivation. Namely, fellowship and relationship and closeness and unity with Jesus and with the Father. When you think about, 
It, uh, here, here's one way to tell the story of the gospel. We were, all of us, we are, by nature and by choice, united to sin, right? We, are, we start out, we start out united to sin. We are united to sin. We are united to uh, the judgment that it incurs. We are united, united to the judgment that it is. We are united to the uh, to the uh, to Satan into the kingdom of darkness. We are united to evil. We are united to sin. Jesus comes on the ultimate rescue mission, and it is a mission of you guessed it, separation. It is a mission of separation. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he left that. He left his place in heaven. He took on human flesh. He became a man. This mission of separation. In order to do what? In order to ultimately separate us, to enact that principle in our lives, to separate us from sin, from the kingdom of darkness, to transfer us to the kingdom of life, uh, of light, so that we could be united with God the Father. So you go from united to the wrong thing, sin, separated by the, by the, the work of Jesus Christ, separated from that, ultimately so that you can be united with God the Father and his family. And so unity is the goal of holiness. Unity, unity is the end game of holiness. Unity to the right thing. Unity to the right one. Unity uh, to God himself. Unity with the Father. Separation from all that is opposed to him. God is light. In him there is no darkness. The, the light has no fellowship with the darkness. And so the principle of separation, the principle of holiness, is for the purpose of, of creating unity with God. I was thinking of, uh, the, uh, I was thinking of this idea of holiness and, and the, the separateness of God, the otherness of God, the transcendence of God, the, all these, these big words that theologians use, right? Uh, the, the mystery, even, of God, that God is so infinitely other. You can't get, you can't get your mind around him. You can't fully grasp He's revealed himself. Yes, that's, that's a, even that is a mystery that, that blows our minds that you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure out and you'll never, you will never solve that mystery. How is it that the, that the completely separate, transcendent, holy, other, creator, God has any interaction at all with those of us who are not God, with creatures? How is that even possible? The mystery that God meets us, that he reveals himself to us. It's incredible. I was thinking about the mystery of holiness, and I've I've uh, been re I read them as as a kid, and I've been rereading the Lord of the Rings, and so yes, we're going to go nerd level five thousand for a second. Just bear with me. <laughs> Some of you love this, and others of you are like, wow. Um, but you've seen the, all of you have seen the movie, so I know you you track on some point at some level okay so uh, so I've been rereading uh, the Lord of the Rings, and there's this character in the first book. Uh, who's not in the movies? I'm so glad because it it, it would have ruined everything. Um, it, it would have ruined this character. I'm so glad he's not in the movies. He's in he's in the, the first book, and his name is Tom Bombadil. Right? He's this this guy, Tom Bombadil, and he's just kind of this wild, jolly. He's always singing, and he's just a very strange character. And there's a chapter there's a chapter called in the book. There's a chapter called in the house of Tom Bombadil. In the house of Tom Bombadil. And I, I, I recently reread this chapter, and I thought, this has got to be, I mean, and I, I'm, I'm really going nerdy on you, but this has got to be one of the greatest chapters ever written in the history of literature. It's just incredible. There's all these descriptions of food and drink, and there's all these poems and songs and the descriptions of the house and what's going on and the, the emotions and the mood and the feeling of the, of the characters. It is just a, it, it, is, it is savory, right, to, to read this. I mean, you're, I mean, I was, I could taste the tastes, I could smell the smells. I was, as I was reading, I was getting hungry, right? It was having that kind of effect on me, just deeply impacting me. And, um, and it's this, this chapter, and it's this guy, Tom Bombadil, and he, and he comes into the story, and you have this amazing chapter, and then he just goes away, and that's it, and that's it. And uh, for years, people have wondered why did Tolkien, why did like what is it with this guy? Like literally, Peter Jackson, who made the movies, there's he was interviewed. Why didn't you put Tom Bombadil in the 
movies. And he literally said, well, he's, he, he was not, he's not essential to the plot. So I didn't put him in there. So, so for years, people have wondered, why did Tolkien put this guy in the story? He's, he's very strange. He's, an, he's ancient. He's older than any of the other characters in the book. He's older than Gandalf, old, even older than Sauron and all the, the powers of darkness. He's, the, he's this ancient person. There's no record of his family line. He has no, no, no listing of father or mother. And he just shows up into the story. And one of the things that happens when they're in the house, the, the hobbits are there. Frodo has the ring, of course. And, and you've seen the movies, right? So you track. He's got the ring. And, uh, and you know, all the, the powers of darkness and the evil associated with the ring. And, and he, gives, he gives the ring to Tom Bombadil, and, and, and he starts, Tom Bombadil starts throwing the ring up and playing with it and laughing and singing. And he puts the ring on. Tom Bombadil puts the ring on. And guess what? He doesn't go invisible. He doesn't go invisible. The ring has no effect on him. He is totally unaffected by evil, completely unaffected. Uh, and then he just goes away, right? Why did, why did Tolkien put him in the story? I think, I, I'm, I'm guessing, but I think it's because he wanted an element, he wanted a feeling of holiness in his story. That here's this guy who just comes out of nowhere, and you, he's, he's a profound mystery. You cannot explain him, and you might not even know exactly why he's in the story, but he's there to give you this one chapter of this just savory you know, descriptions of food and all of this stuff, and it's something that you long for. You want to you be there. like You want to be around the table. You want to be a part of it. You're looking in. I want to be at that party, and then he goes away, but it creates this sense of otherness, of, of holiness, of separation. It creates this sense of just transcendent mystery in the story. And then people ask, they ask this about Gandalf and the eagles, right? Why, didn't, why couldn't Gandalf have just, have just flown an eagle to Mordor and solved all the problem? And well, you know, it's a fair question. Why didn't, why didn't they just give the ring to Tom Bombadil? Why didn't Tom, if he's totally unaffected by it, if, if evil has no power over him, why didn't they just give the ring to him and have him march into, into Mordor and destroy the ring and, and take care of it all? And the answer is so simple, friends, because Tolkien didn't write boring stories. <laughs> That's why. Why did, why, when you get saved, why doesn't God just immediately free you from the struggle? You know what I'm talking about? This whole spirit versus the flesh thing? When you get saved, why doesn't God just immediately, right then and right there, I mean, you're justified, you are saved, your salvation is secured in a moment of time, repentance and faith, saved, totally saved, eternal salvation, secured. So why, do, why doesn't God just go the whole way and just immediately free every one of us from ever being tempted to sin ever again, ever having to fight against sin ever again, ever having to repent of sin ever again, ever having to confess sin ever again? Why doesn't God just free you immediately from the struggle? Because God doesn't tell boring stories. That's why. And he's not, he's refusing, he's refusing to tell a boring story with your life, which leads us to the last point, and uh, the band can come out, and we'll get this last point. Atonement is never, ever finished, dot, 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 until, dot, dot, dot. Atonement is never, ever finished until. You read Leviticus cover to cover. And one of the big ideas is blood. There's a lot of blood. Over and over again, these words that repeat, blood, offering, atonement. Blood, offering, atonement. Blood, offering, atonement. Over and over and over and over again. So many of the sacrifices, check this out. So many of the sacrifices, the offerings, are for cases of sin when a person has sinned unintentionally. When a per, they don't even know it. You don't even know you messed up. You sinned unintentionally. You realize it. Oh my gosh. And you get to the, you get to the tabernacle with your animal, blood, 
offering atonement. I was thinking about that. Uh, you know, if, if we get ourselves in trouble unintentionally, think about how much trouble we get ourselves in when we get our actual will involved. <laughs> right? We sin, we, we sin when we don't, we're, we're sinning when we don't even know that we're sinning. Think about, how much, think about how much trouble we get ourselves into when we actually get our will and volition involved. Blood, offering, atonement, over and over and over and over and over again. Will it ever end? Will it ever be complete? Once a year, there's this day of atonement. And it's kind of just the, the, it's kind of the, the, the grand finale of, of all of the, the ceremonial sacrificial system of the law where once a year, there's a scapegoat and there's, a, there's an offering, there's a sacrifice that the high priest makes just, just to be extra sure that we've atoned for all of the sins of all of the people. The day of atonement. The ones, the ones that weren't confessed, the ones that stayed in the dark, the ones that, weren't, that st- are still unknown to the mind and to the heart. We have this day of, of atonement just to, just to kind of do this, this, this big sweep to just cover all of it. But year after year, this went on. Year after year and decade after decade and century after century. Blood, blood, blood. Will it ever end? A lot of the law, I, I, did, I don't know what, whether to laugh or to cry at this. A lot, of, a lot of the law, as you read through Leviticus, is it's in there. A lot, a lot of the, the rules and the commands and the sacrifice sacrificial ceremonies, a lot of them are in there just to make up for the fact that you have a sinful priest right? Think about that for a second. You imagine yourself in, uh, in the desert, right? Or, or in ancient Israel somewhere, and you're, you're just a common person, right? You're just, you're just an Israelite, and you realize you've sinned. Oh, oh no, I got to get this right. And so you bring your animal to the tabernacle or to the temple for the priests to make atonement for you to, to do the sacrifice. And you show up, and you're looking at this guy. Well, he's a sinner too. Is this going to work? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a mediator. I'm looking for, a, for someone who can broker this deal between me and God, who is perfectly, totally, utterly holy and separate from all of us down here and all of this sin. I'm looking for, I'm looking for someone who can actually broker this deal. Is this guy going to cut it? I mean, he's a sinner. Don't tell me he's not a sinner. He absolutely is a sinner. You know what the law says? It says, when the priest sins, when the priest sins, the people are guilty of the priest's sin because he's the representative. And so, he, so the, priest, the priest sins and he passes that guilt down to the people and now we have a problem. And so there's a, whole, there's a whole sacrifice in the law that's laid out for how to deal for when the priest sins. When the priest sins, the people are guilty and so you've got to make atonement for the priest and for the people. Bummer. Just over and over again, this goes on. Well, what if, what if that whole thing could be reversed? What if that whole thing could be reversed? What if, what if it wasn't a priest who sins and then passes his guilt down to the people? What if you had a priest who never sins, who is totally without sin, and then takes the guilt of the people that they've incurred through their own sin and takes that upon himself? Could a sacrifice be made for that? And that's exactly what happens. Atonement is never, ever, ever finished until Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, after making atonement for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In, in, the, in the book of Leviticus, the priests always have to keep this lamp burning in the tent. God always had the lamp burning. And it signifies that the that atonement is never done. The work is never done. It's never over. You're never off the job. 
Got to keep that lamp burning day and night. The, the lamp must be burning. And, and day and night, the priests would do, would do the work. And year after year, over and over again. And so when the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, after the cross and after the resurrection and after his ascension to the Father, that he quite literally took a seat, that is an incredible thing to say. And it's true. And right now, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what that tells you and what that tells me and what that tells the whole world is that the work of atoning for sins is done. That it's over. That it's done. That there will never, ever be another sacrifice for sin. There will never be another drop of blood shed for the forgiveness of sins because Jesus Christ on the cross, when he shed his blood, that was the once for all, once for all time, perfect, total, complete sacrifice for the forgiveness, for the removal, for the atoning of the sin of the world. And that would include you and your sin. And that would include me and my sin. Which means, as we think about, okay, God is the standard and personalized obedience and sin is a judgment in and of itself and let, you know, let the insanity of sin fortify your courage to walk in the truth and holiness is separation. And, and so with whatever sin is entangling you, enact that, get violent with it, enact that principle. And in all of that, undergirding all of that, the foundation of everything, the foundation of all of that is the fact that you have already been justified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so God, God, right, the law, in the law, God said, be holy as I am holy. And through his son, Jesus Christ, he looks at you and he says, you are holy because I, I have already done the work. I've already separated you from your sin. You are holy. Now you can live holy. And why didn't he just, why, why didn't he just end the struggle immediately? Why do you have to wake up tomorrow and, and fight your sin? And why is it going to be hard? When will it be over? It'll be over when you die. And I mean that in the most encouraging way possible. It will be over when you die. Why the struggle? Because God is not telling a boring story with your life. He's telling an incredible story with your life. Did you know that in talking about the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and his resurrection, that the Bible says that angels long to look into these things. Think about this. There's not a single angel in all of God's, God's army. There's not a single angel that knows what it's like to be forgiven. But if you're in Christ, you know what it's like. Angels long to look into that. Man, I kind of... It's like looking at the, the house of Tom Bombadil. I kind of want to be in on that. You are in on it. God has invited you and he's given you a seat at his table. He's not telling a boring story with your life. And so, there's, it's so easy, it's so easy to look for justification for your sins in everything except Christ. It's so easy. One of the things we do is we do, it's through comparison, right? Through comparison. Well, at least I didn't do that. Or at least I'm not as bad as that. Or at least I did do these things. And we start, we start to get kind of that mental comparison. Maybe we actually have people in mind that we're thinking of that we're not as bad as. And, and so we go for justification by comparison. That's not going to work, friend. You stand before the judgment throne at the end of all things, you're not going to tell God, well, at least I didn't do that. And so what this means is you have to come to Christ. You have, you have to come to Christ. It's the, it's the only way. You have to come to Christ. And I heard one pastor say it. I, think, I thought it was so good. I, I'd never thought of this. You know, the, you know the phrase, come to Jesus moment? Have a come to Jesus moment? You know that phrase? Oh, that, that guy just needs to have a come to Jesus moment. Or she just needs to have a come to Jesus moment. Or, or I'm gonna have, <laughs> I'm gonna have a come to Jesus talk with that person. 
Now, catch this. The intention behind that phrase is actually the exact opposite of what it means to come to Jesus. Because the intention, the, what, what we mean by that, I'm going to have a come to, come to Jesus talk with that person. What we mean by that is that person really needs to clean up their act. They need to get it together. I'm going to talk with them and I'm going to straighten them out. They need to straighten out. They need to clean up. They need to have a come to Jesus moment. They need to clean themselves up and get right. And that is the exact opposite of what it means to come to Jesus because you can't come to Jesus on the basis of you getting cleaned up or you getting yourself right. You can only come to him and he will do that work for you. And so come to Jesus in the true sense of what it means to come to Jesus. You come with your sin. And that sin goes to him and it's paid for through his shed blood on the cross. And then he's the perfect priest. He doesn't sin and transfer guilt to you. He's the perfect priest of righteousness. You confess, you repent, and he transfers his righteousness to you. That's how that works. He takes your guilt and your sin, and he gives you his righteousness. That is what it means to come to Jesus. When will the fight be over? When you're dead. But you can wake up tomorrow knowing that you are, that, that, you, are, you may be living many things. And your life may be many things, but it is not a boring story. It's a story that God is writing to show the world this incredible mystery that we were united to sin and death, that Jesus, on the ultimate mission of separation, separated us from that to unite us to him and to the Father. Would you stand with me? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have separated us from our sin and that you've united us to yourself through Jesus. Lord, I pray anyone here has separation anxiety, doesn't know, is not sure about their life, their future, or their standing with you. I pray that you would grant that person the gift of repentance and faith, that they would come alive in Jesus' name, that they would come to Jesus, not thinking they can clean themselves up, but that they would come to Jesus and receive by faith the work that has already been done, the atonement that's already been won. Lord, for all of us, may we be encouraged to unite ourselves to you, to put our sin to death, to choose to follow you, to, to tell an amazing story of victory and redemption with the life that you've given us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and amen.